Alrighty, turn with me to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to carry on with our study that we're doing through the book of 2 Timothy. And, um, and if you, I assure you agree with me, it was, it's been very interesting, the last instruction. Paul's giving his last instructions to the church, um, you know, specifically to Timothy. But you and I have these, this book, this last book written by the Apostle Paul before his death, before he departs from this world and some last charges to us as a church and um, how to take care of things and how, to, how we need to stick with the Word of God and preach the Word, be instant in season, out of season, you know, and because um, there's going to come a time when they will not endure sound doctrine, that people are not going to want to hear God's Word being preached to them. They want to hear nice stories and make feel-good things like that. And um, that's, that is a sign of, um, you know, perilous times that shall come, you know, and I think we're in that time. So I think we're in those last days. I don't know how long it's going to be before the Lord comes. I don't know. I, I have no clue, you know. Um, if I knew, I would tell you. But, you know, I don't know, and I can give you my opinion, but my opinion might stink, you know, just like my armpits, you know. Uh, no, it doesn't stink that much this morning. Okay. <laughs> But, um, you know, so I don't know. If I knew that answers, I would give those answers, but we can't because we don't know when it's going to happen. What I do know is that we need to be what? Ready for it. And we need to be looking for it. Okay? Last time we were together here, I said to you, don't wish for the catching away to become. We all want to get out of here, but every day you wish and you pray for the catching away and, and the rapture to happen, that day that you pray for that, there's, an, you know... When we're out of here, the, the opportunity for somebody else to get saved is very slim. And they can't get saved under the grace and peace. They're going to have to get saved in a, wrath, in, in a period of time. God's pouring out His wrath upon this world. And, and the chances of that is going to be very extremely, extremely, extremely slim. So if for every day that God still extends for us uh, to take us home, and, and, we, you know, not, and the Lord's not coming to bring us home, it's a day that we still can preach to the world grace and peace not the thing that Todd was talking about wrath we're not appointed to wrath we appoint to, to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ we have a hope man and we should be excited about that hope what are you doing with that you know is the question but let's go read in 2nd Timothy chapter 4 and my message today is this is really the second part of be ready to be offered but I want to title this one this morning maybe Bruce can do that when he when he puts a title on YouTube he says you know do not fear death do not fear death be ready for it okay somebody told me that will be a nice bumper sticker you know be not do not fear death be ready for it and so and we have the message to be ready for it. We don't have to fear death. And we're going to look at that this morning, why we do not have to fear death. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. By the way, as long as I can, as long as I will, I will be preaching the word, whether you want to hear it or not. My job and my responsibility and your responsibility is to preach the word. That's what we need to do. Okay, be instant in season, out of season. Reproof, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Who's the they there that they're talking about? Who's they? Is it just the world? No, what I'm told to you, and as I've been showing you through the scriptures here, it's not the world out there, it's the actual church, the so-called church, that's going to turn their, away, their ears away from the truth. They will depart from the truth, and they don't want to really hear it, and they're going to want to have teachers having itching ears to tell them what they want to hear, not what they should be hearing. And they, verse 4 says, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. Verse 5, Paul says to Timothy, this is the last instruction he gives him, the last charge as such. He says, but watch thou in all things. The things that he needs to watch out is the things that Timothy, but Paul has been mentioning and telling Timothy in the previous chapter and in the previous verses that precedes. Okay? But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. That tells me as you're going to watch in all things and you're going to give attention to this and you're going to be preaching the word, what's going to happen? You will endure afflictions. And you have to allow it. You have to suffer it. Endure it. Okay? 
do the work of an evangelist. What do we do? We herald the good news. We tell people about the good news. And the way that we do that is with love. We speak the truth in what? Love. Our speech is, be filled, is, 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 is filled with grace and seasoned with what? Salt. We don't argue. We don't fight. And we don't publicly be in this mad, we just mad at the world. No. In love and in peacefulness, we share the truth with them. Because that's what God did to us. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. When he says make full proof of thy ministry, what you're doing is you actually, what God has done in you, that the word of God is finishing in you, you prove it. And it's an evident to the world out there as you stand for the truth of God's word. Then he says, as he's finished with that, in verse, we already went through those verses, in verse, verse, um, verse 6 says, I am now ready to be offered. As Paul is writing to Timothy, and I can sure as Timothy reads this, and Timothy already tearful and all anxious and all these things that's going with him, he's reading these words and he's been edified in the words up to now and he's reading these words that Paul, his beloved apostle, his, his, his spiritual father as such, that Timothy was a son, a beloved son for, 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 for Paul. He had a great relationship with Paul. And Paul is writing to young Timothy, or younger Timothy, and he says, For I am now ready to be offered... And the time of my departure is at hand. Imagine Timothy reading that and he's, you know, he knows, he says, you know what? Paul doesn't have a lot of time anymore. You know, he's ready to be offered. And we talked about being offered there. We talked about, you know, Paul's life has been a, a life of, uh, of, of sacrifice. We talked about our lives that God has called us. By the way, go with me to Romans here, chapter 12 quickly. Romans chapter 12. As he's reading to the, as, as, as Paul is writing to the church, the body of Christ, you and I, and he beseeches us. In Romans chapter 12, Robert used this verse this morning as well. You know, it's very important to us. In Romans chapter 12, is 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. Your body is a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable on God, which is your reasonable service. And we know Paul did that. We know Paul did that to the full extent of what the message that, of what God has given him. The charge that Paul received from God, the charge that he received from the Lord Jesus Christ, he did it to the full extent because he says that. He says that in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I have, I have fought a good fight. I have kept, I, I, I have finished the course. I have what? I have kept the faith. Paul did it. Okay. And so for, you know, you know who, who's the only person that can really charge you? It's the one that did it. If somebody didn't do it, you know, if you tell me, you need to, like, you know, for example, we're going to go to this, you know, like this bicycle trip I did a few weeks back, you know, and somebody says to me, you just need to carry on, you know, do it like I did. And I only did two days. They didn't do the full finished course of six days, you know. And I only did two days, and then I'm like, how can you tell me to do it and what to do? You see, you haven't done it. But the person that has done it, Paul did it. And by the way, the Lord Jesus Christ did it too. He laid his life down. He went to fulfill the will of his Father. He did according to what the Lord, the Father wanted him to do. He was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And Paul was obedient, following Christ, obedient until his death. And by the way, Paul's death, I believe, was not a death of old age. It was a death of being killed. He was killed because he was preaching the gospel of the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the world absolutely hates. Satan and his angels absolutely hates the good news of the gospel of Christ. And they will afflict you and they will persecute you when you make a stand for that. Paul did that. He did the sacrifice. Go back with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. He says, I, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. We know that Paul's death is going to be imminent. Okay? It's going to be very close. I mean, so here we go. Time of my departure is at hand. I'm not preaching through that again because I've done all that information before, but I just want to show you quickly here yes, as I recap of the things that we talked about before. He says, and at the time of my departure is at hand. When's Paul departing to? 
You know, he's not, get, he's not getting on a plane and he's flying to Hawaii to go and ride some nice surf there and spend some great time of holiday there. No, this guy is departing from this world and to depart to be with where? To be with the Lord, which is far better, by the way. That's why we should not fear death because it's, when you depart, guess what? It's far better you were present with the Lord. Go with me to, say, to Philippians quickly. Go with me to Philippians quickly. Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1. Verse 20. Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. As you read these verses, as we read these verses, put ourselves into that verses, say to ourselves, can we identify with this? In verse 20, Paul says to the Philippians, he says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as, as, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it by, be by life or by what? Or by death. Verse 21, For to me to live is what? Is Christ. Is who? I mean, it's Christ. And to die is what? gain there is in death for the believer there's gain in death for the believer there's gain but if I live in the flesh this is the fruit of my labor yet what I shall choose I what not for I'm a straight I'm in a straight betwixt two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ which is far better. He says, I have a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Because for Paul, departure means to be with Christ. Your and my departure out of this world means to be with who? Christ. Now surely, surely in our minds as, 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 as human beings, we think if I depart, my wife is going to be alone. My children is not going to have me around anymore. My church family won't have me around. What, what about them? It's a, it's a legitimate worry. And Paul says, he says in this passage, it's far better for me to remain here for you. But I know when I depart, my desire is to depart and be with the Lord. I've seen people suffering in life. I see people going through really physical suffering. And towards the end of their lives, they said, you know, I wish I can depart. I wish I can just go be with the Lord because this is too heavy for me to bear. What is the good news about this all if we do have a loved one that is departed and to be with the Lord? What is the good news for us about that? You know? Isn't that just sad news? No, it's not just sad news because we know our loved one, especially if they were in Christ, especially if they believe the gospel, they are where? With the Lord, present with the Lord. They departed and are with Christ. That gives me a sorrow. That doesn't mean I should not sorrow. I sorrow, but I sorrow with hope. Because I look forward to eternity that I'm going to spend with the Lord and with those that I loved for eternity. And my life here is so temporal and so quick and so like that compared to eternity. Yet we focus all our lives on this, this little piece of this 70, 80, 90 years that we live on this earth. Everything, we invest everything in our mind and our body and our soul into what this life is, is, uh, is around for us. And we're not, we're not preparing for eternity. Because this is more important to me right now than eternity. However, we're going to live the longest part of our life is eternity. This is just like grass. We go up and we fade and we're gone. We're like a vapor, you know, you go, and then you're gone. And so we focus on this vapor instead of focusing on this eternal destiny that we can spend. You're either going to spend eternal destiny in two places. A friend of mine used to say, you're going to go to smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> you know, you're going to go either one of the two. You know, you're going to either go to heaven for eternity to be present with the Lord and to be part of that, or you're going to go to hell for eternity, an eternal lake of fire, to be in torments for it. It's either two places. And I just spoke to somebody in, um, uh, up in Ohio. We're talking to people on the street there about the gospel. I was, we were sharing the gospel with people, and people said, ah, I don't know if I believe that and all that stuff. You know, I, said, I said, well, you choose not to believe it. That's fine. It's your choice. 
However, let me tell you something. If I'm wrong about all of this and I die and there's nothing, I've got nothing to lose, man. But my faith is placed in that book and God's Word and I trust it to be so. I said, but if you're wrong, if you're wrong and you reject the gospel and the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and you're wrong and you die and you've never made the choice to receive the finished work of Christ who died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. You've never made a choice to believe and trust that and trust His faith that is done for you. You open your eye, when your, your death happens, you're not going to be present with the Lord if, this is, if what I'm saying is right. And I believe it's right. I don't, I don't doubt it in any moment. I'm persuaded. I'm fully persuaded. What God said He's going to do, He's going to do. I said, but if you're wrong about this and you reject the gospel, guess where you are? You're in torment. You're in hell. And guess what? You'll be taken out of that hell and you'll be placed before the white throne judgment, a, white, a great white throne of Jesus Christ, and you'll be sent to the eternal lake of fire for eternity where the worm doth not die, where there's no end. Why would you take, why would you play with your life like that? Why would you want to play with your eternal destiny like that? You have a choice to choose to believe the gospel now. Don't put it off till tomorrow because I tell people, you walk out of that door, you walk down that stairs, and you don't pay attention because somebody's talking to you, you to turn around and some crazy guy that wants to get down to the water and get his fishing done because he had to be in church and he was sitting there thinking about fishing rather than being in church and he wants to get down and he hits you with a car and you die right there. That's it. You have no, you have, none of us have a guarantee how long we're going to live. You don't know. None of us here know if we're going to still be alive tonight at 6 o'clock or even at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We don't know. So why don't we make right now and tell people that we minister to to make right with it right now. Choose today. Make the decision. Make the choice to place your faith in the faith of Christ who died for our sins, was buried and rose again. He paid for all our sins. Even before I was born, He paid for my sins. All paid in full. And so, I have the gift of eternal life because God has given it me freely by His grace. God didn't ask me to come and give anything up or give up your drinking and give up your, your, your whatever you're doing. He says, just come. I have given you, I have paid for your sins. I fully paid the price. All you have to do is believe it. Trust it. Trust what I've done for you. I was made sin for you so that you can be made the righteousness of God. That's free. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to give anything now. But you don't have to walk down here. No, you don't. Have, you, do, you should not walk up here and confess your sins because confessing your sins will not save you. What saves you is the finished work of Christ that died for our sins, paid for our sins, and fully paid for it. You can't turn your back on your sin and say, Lord, I'm going to turn my back on my sin. I'm going to turn from my sin and I'm going to turn to you, Lord, and say, Lord, please receive me or come into my heart. Why would you ask him to come into your heart and please receive me if you could turn from your sin? The fact is we can't. None of us can do anything about our sin situation. That's why Christ died. Repentance is a change of your mind about your life and your future. And that's going to determine if you're ready for death or not. Paul was. He's looking forward to that. There is no fear in Paul's language here about death. There's actually, what is there is a hope. There is actually a like, henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Woohoo! I'm looking to that. Because I love his appearing and his kingdom. So you may ask this, why are you so serious? Well, this is a life and death matter. Is an eternal death or eternal life matter? An eternal death, by the way, is not the cessation of things. Eternal death is an eternal consciousness of death. So Paul says, I'm ready to depart, and my departure is at hand. So Paul knows that we talked about Peter being ready, and the Lord told Peter how he's going to die. And I think Paul is going to die a martyr death because he's preaching the cross. So I said, What I'm saying to you is, do not fear death. Do not fear death. Rather be ready for it. If you're ready for it, you don't have to fear it. Because you know what it brings you. And by the way, if loved ones stay behind, you know who comforts those loved ones? First and all, the God of all comfort and the Father of all mercy. 
He comforts you. You know what? And those fellow believers around you and those fellow saints has been comforted by the comfort of God and by the mercy of the Father will comfort you in the same way that they've been comforted. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I was just thinking this po- I was riding or I was riding on my on my bicycle uh, about a, a week and a half or whenever ago I was just riding there and I was thinking about you know I was riding with these guys and they were so weak I, they couldn't keep up with me I was so fit and strong and everything else you know <laughs> no not really but I'm riding out there and I was just thinking at this one moment towards the end I'm thinking you know we, I'm riding in rain it's raining I'm riding through the city of Cleveland towards the end and it's raining and it's hailing I mean the hail is pouring down on us and I'm thinking what am I doing on this bicycle but I'm thinking of death you know, at the moment, I was saying, you know, and I'm like, woo! And, and be honest with you, I wasn't like scared. I was like excited about it, thinking about it, you know. No, maybe my wife won't be like it that I'm excited about death and leaving her. <laughs> Nobody loves that. But I know God is faithful, right? Because we have hope. We hope with sorrow. No, sorrow with hope, sorry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all what? Comfort. You know what God delights to? The Bible says in the book of Psalms, the, the Father delights in showing mercy. He delights in it. It's something that delights God the Father to show mercy. Who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings in Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. There's a consolation that comes by Christ. But you've got to be in Christ to receive and to be part of that consolation and receive that consoling. You understand what I'm saying? Don't fear death. Be ready for it. Okay, be ready for it. As a matter of fact, I would dare to go even so far to say, don't fear death, be ready for it, but I would go so far to say, embrace it. Because death, I'm not saying go kill yourself, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying death is a departure to be present with the Lord. That is what it is. Okay. Pray for every day that you can still be active and alive and to preach the gospel. But don't fear it. Don't, don't, if, if you die, you die. You're present with the Lord. That's it. Okay? And so we, we, we're ready for it. You know what death you should fear? You know what death you should fear? The second death. That's the death you should fear is the second death. The second death is where God takes you and sends you to the eternal lake of fire. For in nobody, for everybody that is not saved and has choose not to believe the gospel, they end up in a second death. Psalm fifty-six. Go with me to Psalm fifty-six. We we'll look at the Psalms. A Psalm writer. I mean, he was chased. Saul chased him, wanted to kill him. His own enemies, the, 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 the his enemies, the the, the Phil, uh, Philistines, um, wanted to kill him. And they are after this, this, this David. And fifth, in Psalm 56, if you will be with me, verse 1 there. And by the way, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture is profitable unto us. It brings comfort and hope. And in Psalm 56, the psalm writer, he says, Be merciful, verse 1 says, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. Mine enemies would daily swallow me up, for they many that fight against me. O thou most high, what time I am afraid, I will trust in what? When he's afraid, where is he placed his trust? In God. Where should our trust be when we're afraid? In God. In God will uh, will I praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. I, can, I would not fear what flesh can do unto me. Every day they rest my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. That sounds to me similar to what Paul is telling Timothy to preach the word. And what is endure afflictions. 
You know, here's the thing that's going on with David. They, they gather themselves, verse 6, together. They hide themselves. They mark my steps when they wait for my soul. Shall they escape by iniquity? In thine anger cast down the people, O God. Thou tellest my, my, my wanderings, put down my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is with for me. In God will I praise his word. In the Lord I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. And by the way, under the system of the law, God can tell the, because of enemy, uh, Israel's conditional system that they lived under the law with God, He can say, destroy my enemies, and God's going to destroy His enemies. You are my enemies, God's not going to destroy until the judgment. We're going to suffer afflictions. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to possibly be killed for the sake of Christ. That's the reality of it. Thy vows are upon me, O God, I will render praises unto thee, for thou hast delivered my soul from what? Ha ha, David knows something about his soul that's been delivered from what? From death. Wilt not, thou, wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling? For I walk before God in the light of the living. The fact that the point that I want to press, what I bring your attention to here, is the fact that David was not afraid of death because he did something. What you and I need to do is to put our trust in God. And today, in God's word being completed, we have so much more to hold on that David had to hold on. We have the completed Word of God. We have the promise of God of eternal life to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. We have all that going for us. How much more can we trust in God? You can't go in life, through life, trusting in yourself because you'll fail yourself every time. I will fail you. You will fail me. God will never fail us. Because he has us. In Matthew chapter 10, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, I can't read all these verses because of time, but in Matthew chapter 10, the Lord's telling his disciples, and he's telling, in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Uh, there's so many verses. You need to read the rest of the chapters and the preceding and, and be after of what we just read in verse 28. Read what goes before and what goes after. And verse 28 of Matthew 10 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and, and, uh, both soul and body in hell. Who do we need to fear? Fear God. Now you and I don't fear God in the same way that the unbeliever fear God. We fear God because we have a reverential respect and fear of who God is and because He's a righteous God that we deal with. In the darkest and the most difficult time of your life, you will not have to fear death. Go with me to, to Psalms. Uh, no, Psalms. Psalms. To the book of Psalms, and we're looking at Psalm 23. It's a psalm that you always hear being read at the, read at the funerals and etc., etc. Et you know, that's just, it's a well-known psalm. I know that psalm from when I was that wee little kid. I had to rem memorize that uh, I had to memorize that psalm. The years may have that I shall hear on El Friesni. You don't know what I'm saying, but I can quote that in Afrikaans, okay? Because I learned it from a little kid. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea! Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God's correction in his word is what comforts David. And he says, even when he walks through the valley of the shadow of death, that means in the gloomy darkness of what is fear facing, he won't fear it. Because God is with him. God is going to lead him. He knows that, he understands that, and he can, write about, he can write about it. I will fear no evil. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, to us, the body of Christ today. Romans chapter 8, if you will. From verse 30. Romans chapter 8, from verse 30. Verse 30. 
I understand that, the, you know, I, when I talk to people about death, when I talk to people about death, one of the things I learn about people when they talk about death, everybody says, I'm not afraid of death. I'm talking about believers now. I'm just afraid and scared of the process. I mean, I would hate to have to live for 10 years you know, in pain. and I don't like, nobody likes that. But even in that, I don't have to fear. Even in that, I don't have to be afraid because God is with me. There's nothing that can separate me from His love that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans chapter 8. He says there in verse 30, he says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. He's talking about us. What shall we say then for these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with, all, with him also freely give us all things? The things he talked about from verse 28 on. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? That's you and I. It is God that justifieth. Who is he, he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession, what? For us. Let me ask you as a believer, let me tell you, not ask you, as a believer, let me tell you. But in Romans chapter 8, you have the Godhead for you. You have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, making intercessions with prayers that cannot be uttered for us, according to God's Word. You have the Lord Jesus Christ making intercession for us, and you have God the Father for us. And because we have all of that, we do not have to be afraid. We need to rest in this. We need to find our comfort in this. Who is he that condemneth? Verse 34. It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is, who is even at the right hand of God and also maketh intercession for us. That's for you and me. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. It's the question that asks, shall anything separate us from the love of Christ? Well, the answer is, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Is a quote they have from Psalm 44, that David has written. They want to kill him all the time, they just want to kill him, because he speaks the words of truth. And because Saul was jealous of him and all these things, and his enemies was against him. Verse 36, as it's, uh, sorry, verse 37, Nay, he says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that what? In all these things, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That means, what does a conqueror do? A conqueror, somebody that conquers, he, he overcomes. For I am persuaded, verse 38 says, why am, I con why am I more than a conqueror through him that loved us? Here's the reason, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing in this world can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, and nothing in the principalities and powers of the air can separate me from the love that is in Christ Jesus. Because I have God for me. Because I made the choice to trust Him and to believe His Word and got placed in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I have eternal life and I have a hope laid up for me in heaven and I'm not afraid of death and I do not fear it because I know whom I believed and am fully persuaded by Him that He's going to keep me safe in His hand. Why do I need to fear? We get very anxious about this world. We get very scary and afraid. 
and I get to some degree rightfully, but you know what? It should never control us. It should never steer us. It should, al it should always be what controls and steer us is the finished work of Christ. It's what God has done for me. And then we can say, I'm ready to depart. My departure is at hand. Let's go. You know? Because I know about eternal life. I would hate to go through this world in anguish about eternity. Not knowing if I'm saved or not saved. I would hate to live like that. Because I know God's word. I know that I have eternal life. I know it. And there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Because the love of God of Christ, it was in Christ Jesus was, the love of God was proved, was made manifest by His Son dying for my sin. And if His Son was made sin for me, surely He's going to keep me safe for eternity. And I can face it with confidence. The fact is, you honor one of every one of us. You know, by the way, Paul says in verse 38, he says, For I am persuaded. You know who else in the Bible was persuaded? Back in chapter 4. Abraham was fully persuaded what God has promised he's going to do. By the truth of God's word. I am fully persuaded by the word of God. That's faith. That is what faith is. Being fully persuaded. And by the way, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, An appointed unto man wants to die, and thereafter the judgment. That's the fact. We all have appointed to die. The only way that you will escape certain death in this world, nobody will escape death, except there's one out. There's going to be one out. And even that out means your body has to physically die to be changed. And that out is the catching away when we're going to be caught up and be raptured out of this world, when Christ comes and changes us and put on and glorifies our body and we put on immortality and we put on incorruption and our vile body is changed like unto His glorious body. But if that doesn't happen, you will not escape death. None of us. And if something that we never will escape, why would you fear it? Why would you want to live in fear of it? When you have the answers not to live in fear of it. Because God has not given you and I as believers a spirit of fear. He told Timothy that in chapter 1. God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And my power, love and sound mind tells me I am fully persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. I don't have to be afraid. And I don't have to be ashamed. I will be afflicted. But in that affliction... I will trust in Him. Joshua says in Joshua 23, 14. I'll just read there quickly. Joshua is going to, he's ready to die. Um, I'm, stop, I'm at the wrong place. Joshua 23. Joshua 23 is Joshua at the end of his month. And by the way, Joshua is the guy that takes the nation of Israel into the promised land. When he's the leader, and he says, what, what he says in verse 23, uh, chapter 23 and verse 14, he says, And behold, this day I am going to the way of all the earth. What is the way of all the earth? Death. Death. He's ready for it. He's ready. He's going he's gonna to go back to what? He's going to go back to dust, his physical body. Well, he's going to go to Abraham's bosom. Or well, Abraham's bosom is then, you know. So Joshua looks forward to that. In Ecclesiastes, it's called this a long home. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Just read it to you quickly. We're not going to get into that passage so much, but I, 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 you know, a couple of times it says that, a long home. But Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 5. And when they shall be afraid of, the, uh, also, when they shall be afraid of that, sorry, I'm, I'm reading and I'm hearing some pages, paging still. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 5. Verse 5 says, Also, when they shall be afraid of, what, uh, of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home. 
That's talking about death. Long home. Death is a long home. Now you're going to live either in white, two houses for eternity. You're going to live in a house with eternal light, with presence with the Lord, or you're going to live for eternity separated from the presence of the Lord in eternal lake of fire. It's a long home. Very long home. Okay. In just interesting thing to say to you. So what, do you, what, what must we do? You know what I think we should do? My answer is, you know, you're in Ecclesiastes. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. You're in Ecclesiastes there. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 10. And then we'll turn over to some other passages in Philippians. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whether thou goest. Basically what the passages say, you know, get on with it now, because when you die it's too late. And today you and I, we are called to redeem the time. We are called to redeem the time and occupy the time and use it for His praise and His glory. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, do it, because when you die it's too late. Do it now. Don't put it off for later. Don't put it off for later. I have several times, I shared with the men yesterday at the men's breakfast, several times I stood with somebody and talked about at the end of their life being sick in hospital. And I have at least two people telling me, I wish I knew these truths way earlier in my life and used my time more wisely. I think... Todd had the same experience with his friend and not waste his life on what satisfy the flesh now because when death is certain and you know you're going to die any day now you live differently if you know for a fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming tomorrow to catch us away 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. tomorrow this is not a prediction by the way, don't quote me but 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, He's coming to, pick up, to fetch us and change us and take us home. What would you do this afternoon? What would you do this evening? I think our priorities will be a little different, don't you? Now, I know we have lived. I have to work. I'm still, I'm still a human being. I have to relax too. I have to rest too and things like that. I'm not suggesting you going out for the next 50 years and every second minute of the moment, you know, read your Bible and pray and preach and preach corner because I don't know how you're going to live because Paul says you, if, you don't eat, neither, if you don't work, neither should you eat. I understand life needs to happen. But our priorities will be different, won't it? I know mine will be. I'm just saying we need to redeem the time. We need to walk circumspectly because the days are evil. For me to live is Christ, to die is what? Gain. So let Christ be manifest and be centered to everything that we do. By the way, you and I don't manifest the life of Christ. He manifested in our lives by us believing what His Word says. He magnifies Himself. He's magnified. And so what we need to do is get on with the truth. Get on with the doctrine. Death is not the end. Death is just the beginning of the rest of eternity. Or the, it's just a continue. Because I already have eternal life. It doesn't begin when I die. I already have the promise of it. So... Why fear it? Let's be ready for it. Let's occupy. Let's redeem the time. And let's be thankful for what He's given us in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not fear men, what they can do. They can destroy this body. Yes, somebody can come up, shoot me, boom, I'm done. But what does that mean? I'm dead. But what does that mean? I departed. <laughs> I'm not there anymore. My body lies there. I'm with the Lord. Boom. What can they do to me? I have eternal life. Right? We thank God for that. Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your free gift of eternal life, for your Son, the life we have in Him, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, not because we worked for it, 
but because of your love, your great love wherewith you loved us, because of your grace. We're thankful for our eternal security that we have in your Son. We're thankful that we can uh, look forward to depart and to be present with our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that our life is hid with Christ in you, our Father. We praise you for that, and we thank you for the hope that you've laid up for us in heaven. We're thankful that you are faithful and you've called us into the fellowship of your Son. We pray for those, everyone here and everybody hear this message, that they will not put off and prolong making a decision concerning their eternal destiny, but they would, that they would trust the finished work of the cross. Trust what you have done for them and your Son has done for them by dying for our sins, being buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And not to trust in works, but to trust in the free gift that you have provided for us through the finished work of your Son. We praise you for these things and we thank you for that by Christ alone. Amen.